Zeus, Yael Safra. Yael, you here? I am here. Good. Can you okay. Hear me? Yes, I hear you. Okay. There you are. Okay. So Yao Safra is a Tanakh teacher at Hafner High School and SKA High School for girls in Long Island. She has taught classes for adults at Congregation Bashalam, the Benot Sinai Summer Program for College Age Women, as well as the Bach Shul in Long Beach, New York. She is a graduate of Stern College and has a master's in Jewish education. This year, she'll be one of the accepted participants in Matan of Yerushalayim online learning program for educators. Yael, welcome. Thank you so much for coming to our group and we look forward to listening to you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Everybody can hear me? Um, yes. Shana okay, great. Shana Tova to everybody. And um, it's a pleasure and an honor to um, be learning with you and speaking with you this morning. What I thought that we could do as it's uh, Arab Yom Kippur practically is think about Sefer Yonah together. Um, it's a story that we are very familiar with. Um, it is a story that is magical. And I'd like to pose two questions on it. Why do we read Sefer Yonah on Yom Kippur? Why do we read it at Mincha? It's the half Torah of Mincha. And I know that... Um, this Nishma group every day is looking for skills and tips and things that they we could all eat, um, internalize and use uh, that are practical. And so while I'm going to do with you a text-based shiur, I know for myself sometimes that it's very hard to get to shul for Yona. Um, maybe there are other women in this group that can recognize that or feel that way. And somehow we make it an effort or the best that we can to get there for Ne'ila. But somehow Yona uh, and Mincha get uh, pushed to the side a little bit. And maybe talking about Yona now and learning it together will help inspire us to be in shul for Yona. And Bezrat Hashem will give us some greater appreciation for this unbelievable Sefer. Yona is one of the, it's one of the only books, by the way, that we read it in its entirety. Usually, when we read a half Torah, it's it's a parak from a Sefer, and throughout the year we might read many prakim from a Yirmiyahu or from Yishayahu or Yechezkel, but we never sit and read all of Yirmiyahu or all of Yishayahu. But Yona uh, gets read as the Maftir from start to end. This book is four chapters long, and it is very different than some of the other books in the Latter Prophets or in the Nevi'a Machronim, in the sense that there's not a lot of prophecy in this book. This nivuah is five words long, and they are as follows. The words that we're all very familiar with. Od arba'im yom v'ninve nehepachet. In 40 days, ninve will be overturned. And that's the entire prophecy. Whereas other nivim achronim are filled with chapters upon chapters of complicated and poetic and intense prophecies. And this one is short and sweet and five words long. And um, it feels like it's more of a narrative. It feels like a story. It's more reminiscent of Hamisha Chumshei Torah that tells a story. Or it's more, um, it reminds us more of Nevi'im Rishonim of Milachim of Yishayahu, where there's narrative and there is story. So we read this book from start to end. And I'm going to read the few psukim to um, just to get us going. And the word of God came to Yona, the son of Amitai, saying, Kum, lechel ninveha irhagdola, 
rise and go to Ninveh, the great city, ukra aleha, and call unto it, ki ra'atam lefanai, because their bad or their evil has risen up in front of me. So Hashem calls out to Yonah, and we have no idea who Yonah is. He just sort of, Yonah just shows up on the scene. Usually when we are introduced to a Navi, we know the Navi tells us who they are, when they, um, when they prophesied, who the kings were of the time, what the political religious uh, situations were going on. And we know nothing here. Hashem just calls out to Yonah. And so it feels like it's out of the blue. And he tells Yonah to go to this great city of Nineveh. But Yakam Yona, so far so good, and Yona gets up, and we expect for it to be that he went to Ninveh to do what God says, because that's the job of a Navi. A Navi is a messenger, a Navi is the representative of God in this world, and the Navi gives the people God's word. And what does Yona do? By Yakam Yona, Livroach Tarshisha, he tries to hide. He runs away from before the presence of God, Milipnei Hashem, by Yered Yafo, he goes down to Yafo, by Yimtsa Onia, coincidence, he goes down to the port of Yafo, and he finds a boat that's heading towards Tarshish, by Yered Ba, and he goes down onto the boat. And Hashem sends this big storm. By the way, the word gadol here also sends to everything about this story is epic. It is large. The city is big and the storm is big. And the fish in Perek Bet is, is big. And there's this theme of things being very um, large in size, which gives a sense of fantasy to it almost. And we wonder if Yona is going to be able to do this. The job seems so big to him. And Hashem sends a storm and Yona, and it sounds like the boat is going to break. And the text puts us on this boat with him. Hashem tells Yonah to get up and go. And Yonah goes down, down, down. He goes down to Yafo. Then he goes down to the boat. And when he is in the boat, he goes down to the bottom of the boat. And what does he do there? Vayeradem. Well, Vayeradem means he went to sleep. Even the show rest or the work, you could hear it. Yeradem. He goes down even further. Yona is doing his absolute hardest to to not fulfill this mission. He is going as far away as he possibly can. And everyone knows, right? The, this boat is filled with idol worshipers. These boats are, is filled with sailors from all over the world. Rashi says that there are 70 languages being spoken on this boat. And the sea captain goes down to Yona and says to him, Malachan Yerdam, Yona, what are you doing? Kum, get up, which is ex rise, which is exactly what Hashem told Yona to do in Pasuk Aleph. The Rav HaChovel, the sea captain, says, Malachan Yerdam, why are you going down? Kum, kra el elohecha, call out to your God. And on this boat, at that moment, all the malachim, malachim with the chet, all of the sailors are calling out to their gods and asking to be saved. And everybody is doing it but Yona. What's ironic is that Yona's prophecy is so um, powerful inside of him. Yona is being a Navi without even being a Navi. Everybody around him is calling out to God. Everybody around him is praying. He didn't even, he doesn't even have to speak. And that is the impact that he has on his environment. It's almost like 
if we wanted to, if the book of Yona was truly about Tshuva, the story could have ended in Perak Aleph because the entire boat does Tshuva. This boat, which is a microcosm of the world, the 70 nations, the Malachim are, it is an international boat filled with sailors. And the Rav HaChovel is speaking God's words to Yona and is telling him to get up. And they start asking him so many questions. Tell us, who are you? What is your profession? May I in Tavo? Where are you from? What is your land? What is your nation? This is a group of people that are open. They ask questions. They look at their environment. They look at what's going on and they try to figure out what can we do here to improve our situation? They are very proactive and they are very curious about Yona, these sailors. And Yona is coming from a very different perspective. He is not open. He is not open to the word of God. He is not open to changing. He is not open to ending this storm. And he says to them, while they ask him question after question after question, he says to them, Yodea Ani, I know what's going on here. I have an understanding of the situation. And it's because of me that this is going on. And I, am, I know what God is doing, says Yona. And I'm not interested in, in participating in it. And it's so interesting that it's not okay maybe to be that way. We don't always know. We think we know. And we like, we like to feel as if we know, or perhaps if we are in control of the situa situation. But Yona has a lesson to learn. And that lesson is going to be that we don't always know. And we don't always understand. And who is Yona that gives him this perspective that things are black and white in this world and that we understand and know what's going on? In order to think a little bit about who this Yona is, we have to um, go back to his name. And his name is Yona ben Amitai. And when we think of the Yona, it's not the first time that we. Um, meet a Yona in, in Tanakh, correct? If we start thinking now, there's another story in the Torah. It's coming up in a few weeks, and that's Parshat Noah. And the Yona there, right? Noah sends the, the dove out of the boat to see if there is dry land, to see if, the, if it's safe to come out. And he has to send that Yona out a few times. The Yona is the ultimate messenger of God. And Ben Amitai, who is Yona's parents? What is his ancestry? And the Malbim says something very interesting. Interesting. Who is Yona? Amru Chazal. Sheyona ben Amitai hayam sad imo mishevet Asher. From his mother's side, he's from the tribe of Asher. The who haya ben haisha ha almana shekilkela et Eliyahu. He was the son of the widow who fed Eliyahu. There's a, a story in Sefer Malachim Bet. In chapter 17, in Perak Yudzayin, where Eliyahu goes to this woman in, um, in the city of Sorfat and asks for food, right? It was during a time of starvation and asks for food and she feeds him. 
and she has a child, and this child gets sick, and Eliyahu revives the child. The child gets sick, it looks like the child dies, and Eliyahu revives him, and that Yonah is the son of this child. And when that Yona, I'm sorry, is this child of this woman that is brought back to life by Eliyahu. And Chazal tell us that when you save somebody, when you save a child, it's as if you are giving birth to them and you become their parents. And when the woman of Sorfat um, sees that, that her child is... Um, is brought back to life. I'm trying to see if I could find it quickly. It's in chapter 17, Perak Yudzayin in Malachim Aleph. And she says to Eliyahu, Atayadati, now I know, Ki Ish Elokimata, that you are a man of God, Udvar Hashem Beficha Emet. And that what comes out of your mouth, the words that you speak, are truth. And what is the name of Yonah? Yonah ben Amitai. Yonah, the son of truth. What kind of word? Yonah is the son of Eliyahu. What is that Midrash trying to teach us? Who is Eliyahu? Eliyahu is a person of clarity. Eliyahu looks, sees it as black and white. Elijah looks at the world and he says, Hashem hu ha Elohim. God is, is the only God. Hashem is the one God. Eliyahu is somebody who says, um, I can't live in this world anymore. If, if Isabel and Ahab, the, the king and queen that rule at that time, if they're going to continue to cause the nation to go astray, he says to Hashem, I want to die. I don't want to participate in this world anymore. Seems to me that Yonah has inherited some of Eliyahu's uh, genetic disposition. And Yonah lives in a world where if you do something wrong, you should be punished for it. Yonah lives in a world of tzedek and in a world of deen. And he doesn't want to go to Nineveh. He doesn't want to participate in a world where things are unclear and things are ambiguous and things are not clearly black and white or good and bad. And... That's the story of Noah as well. In Noah, the Torah tells us that the world is filled with Hamas. It's bad in the world. And Hashem wants to destroy it. When, the, when, things, when you think that things are clear and things are black and white, and sometimes they are, but majority of the time we live in an amorphous world where people are complicated and situations are multi-layered. And very rarely do we live in a society or in a world or do we have relationships that are all good or all bad. Most of humanity doesn't live like that. It's very hard to function in a world like that. And Yonah, Noah also lives in a world like that. We don't see that Noah says to Hashem, um, Hashem, you can't do that. You can't wipe out this world. He doesn't do what Abraham does a few generations later with the city of Sodom and say, but aren't there 50 good people in the world? Won't the true, true judge of the world do justice? Abraham stands there and he argues and he argues and he argues with God. And he, Noah is silent when it comes to what he did. He lets, he's a, a I, I can't think of the exact word that I want, but he doesn't stop it or he doesn't try to stop it. And Yonah feels like Eliyahu. And Eliyahu and Yonah feel a little bit maybe like Noah. And maybe some of the message of Yom Kippur and is 
that we're complicated. And when we stand before Hashem on Yom Kippur, we're not all good and we're not all bad and we're human. And every year we stand before Kaddish Baruch Hu and we clap al chait. We literally say the same things over and over again, every single year. And we wonder, well, are we ever going to get it? And I don't know about you, but in my mind, year after year, I have to work on the same things that I'm weaker at. And, and we don't stop. And comes Yom Kippur in the afternoon. Isn't it funny that we read this story about Shuvah towards the end of Yom Kippur? Wouldn't it be great if we read this parak in the beginning of Elul when we're starting our journey of Shuvah? Wouldn't it be great if maybe we read it as part of Rosh Hashanah or even on the beginning of Yom Kippur? Here we are. Yom Kippur is over. We have been standing and clapping al chait and saying the Yud Gimel Midot all day long. And suddenly we're, we're, it feels like we're at the beginning. And it's at Mincha. It's unbelievable what it is. And maybe, just maybe, at the end of the day, when we are already tired and where we've already feel like we've done the best we can, and and I'll speak for myself here. In the back of my mind, I know that some of the things that I don't like to do, that I wish were otherwise in myself, well, I'm going to do them again. But it's not going to stop me from standing in front of Hashem on Yom Kippur and saying that even though my tshuva is in a hundred percent, it's not black and white. It's, I'm not all or none. When what's interesting is at the end of Perak Dalid, okay, at the end of Perak Gimel, Yona finally makes it to Ninveh. Okay, even though in Perak Aleph, everybody around him does tshuva, by the way, except for Yona. He's so stubborn, he won't do it. Throw me over, kill me, let me die. I can't tolerate living in a world like this, says Yona, where I know that God is going to forgive the city of Ninveh. And the city of Ninveh doesn't deserve to live. They have Hamas, the same crimes of the generation of Noah. That word Hamas that's used in Parshat Noah is used about the city of Ninveh. And Yona says, that's not the world that I live in. And in Perak Gimel, when the king does tshuva, by the way, Perak Aleph and Perak Gimel and Yona are identical, except it's not a boat that is the microcosm of the world. It's the city of Ninveh that is the microcosm of the world, filled with thousands and thousands of people. And it's not the sea captain that... Um, interacts with Yona, but it's the king of Ninveh that interacts with Yona. And it's and Ninveh does tshuva. And in Pirkei Avot, and in the Gemara, in Mishnah Ta'anit, Ninveh becomes the icon or the, um, the example for tshuva. And the Gemara says, what do we do on a fast day? What does one do? We put ashes on our heads and we tear our clothes and we fast and we call out to God, just like the people of Ninveh did. They become the example, the most unexpected city in the world becomes the example for, for connecting to God. Because connecting to God is universal. And even though on Yom HaKippur, it is the most particular, particularistic day of the year where we stand before God in the Kodesh Kodashim, before, or the Kohen Gadol stands there, and we talk about ourselves. But that's not the example for tshuva. The example for tshuva is universal. The icon, the meme in modern day terms for tshuva is the city of Ninveh. And Chazal say, but why? 
It's not a real tshuva. Even Yona doesn't believe it. Yona, at the end of Ninveh, after, again, by the way, he gets Ninveh to do what they were meant to do. Yona is a navi par excellence against his will. And the question is, right? When you have a mission to fulfill in life, when you have a, 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 a designated um a designated experience that you are supposed to have, or if you are supposed to grow in a certain way, says the story of Yona, it's going to happen. It will happen. And you will be that Yona. You will be the messenger that you are meant to be in this world. And Yona, at the end of the story, you expect him to go ahead and go back to, um, to, to, uh, uh, up north or go back to Eretz Yisrael and he doesn't he sits outside right that's and that's the story of the good and he wants to see what's going to happen to the city of Nineveh because he knows that in two weeks or two months or five days or ten days Nineveh is going to go back to their old ways and he sits there and God says, okay, you want to sit there? You can sit there. It's okay. And why does God allow Yonah to do that? The first time that Yonah, in Parak Aleph, when Yonah tries to run away from God, when Yonah tries to hide from his mission, Hashem doesn't let him do it. Hashem throws him out. There's a storm. And then Hashem sends the fish and Yonah spends time in the fish. And then finally Yonah prays and Hashem, the fish spits him out on dry land. And Hashem says to him, do it again. We're going to do this again. And, and Yonah does it, but he does it begrudgingly. He does it with, Od arba im yom binim he says five words. But as soon as Yonah says those five words, as soon as Yonah acknowledges that Hashem is in his life, as soon as Yonah recognizes that he's a partner with God in this world, now God will talk to Yonah. Now there can be a dialogue and Yonah can say what is on his mind. Hashem doesn't get angry at Yonah for doubting. Hashem doesn't get angry at Yonah for not believing or not wanting to carry out the mission or not wanting to participate in whatever it is that Hashem needed from him at this point. As soon as we can have a conversation with God, Hashem will have the conversation with us. But when we turn our backs, when we say, I'm out of here, Hashem is going to call us back and call us back and call us back because that's how much Hashem wants to be in relationship with us in this world. And so as we stand at Yom Kippur and we cry out and we clap the al and we set ourselves up, right, for this black and white world where everything, we're going to do everything and we're going to take on everything. And it's, and it's our speech and it's the way we interact and it's the way we think and it's the way we daven and it's the way we, we judge. And it's the way, I don't know if we could do all that. I don't think I can. I mean, I'm just going to speak for myself. And the answer is that at the end of Yom Kippur, we all know, I know, I'm not gonna get it right. Maybe I'll get it a little bit right. Maybe I'll get it a little bit wrong. And the answer is, Hashem knows it too. And that's okay. And what Hashem wants with us on, on Yom Kippur is relationship. And Hashem, what Hashem wants on Yom Kippur is that the way that Hashem sends Yona the fish and the gourd and the storm and the message, Hashem wants us to be able to internalize those messages and to welcome God into our hearts and to welcome God into our lives. And I thank everybody so much for learning with me. And I wish everybody a Shana Tova and a happy and a healthy new year. And may our tefillot 
crash the heavens as we sit together in the boat, as we represent the world, may we join together and may we build a world that is filled with a Kaddish Baruch Hu. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was absolutely amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody have any questions? Okay. Okay, Yal, let me let me wish you a Gemar Chesim Ataiba, a Gitke Ben Shkur. Amen. May you have Hatzacha Gemura in all your teachings and and in your journey. And um, I hope we will join you in your Shalayim with the Biyaskoyal Tzedek. Amen. Shana Tova. Okay. Amen. Uh, this concludes our uh, day today at Nishmas. We will be back here tomorrow at 7.55 in the morning. Let me wish for everybody a wonderful day. And uh, see you tomorrow, Mr. Shem. Thank you so much, Rebetzin. Thank you, Yael. Thank you, Thank you, Rebetzin. Thank you. Everybody have a great day. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Nomi? Thank you. Thank you so much.